Hi there everybody, Alexander here and uh, welcome to the React course. It's been a long overdue. People have asked me for this course for a long time and uh, finally decided to start it. Uh, it's, as you know from many of my videos, it's not going to be a typical uh, bottom-up uh, course uh, as most other courses are. They're basically a replication of official React documentation, which is by the way amazing and if you really want to learn React, that's also an alternative. Uh, the official documentations are generally the best source to learn. In this course, which I'm going to try to make fairly short uh, because, yeah, it's going to be a mixture of things. Uh, in this first video, I'm going to talk about why React, the build tools and, you know, writing your components. And then we're going to break this in a couple of videos. I don't know how many so far, but uh, we're going to talk in a, we're going to have a video talking about the state separately. And then at the end of this uh, course, if you may, we're going to build uh, some of uh, application where uh, yeah we handle the state we render we compose components we call some services uh, we implement tailwind CSS so we're gonna try to yeah get to the point of a modern react application this is not gonna be a next.js course because I personally myself I'm not a fan of, of next.js myself but uh, the course is gonna teach you everything where, where you can just shift your react app to, to the service side rendering right so um, let's get started basically. So if I switch to my main screen, the main question is why React.js, right? And React.js still currently is by far the most popular uh, UI library. That means that for you, that means that there's a lot of jobs for React still and by far it's, it's the, the, uh, the strongest candidate in that area. Uh, now moving your personal preferences aside, what it is that you like, what it is that you dislike. At the end of the day, you want to get a job and you should try to aim to learn things that can get you to that point. So this is not to say now that React is better or worse than something else. There's some amazing libraries out there like Vue.js, AngularJS framework, uh, Svelte is becoming popular as well. But when it comes to most recent polls that we have, we still don't have 2024 polls because we are relatively early in 2024. You can see the Stack Overflow uh, survey, which is the most um, accurate survey from all surveys, right? Uh, on the internet, uh, you can see that Node.js, React, and actually jQuery, which is understand understandable, jQuery is part of hundreds of millions of websites due to uh, WordPress and stuff like that, right? So you can see the popularity here. Vue.js and Angular are following up. And I, I swelt is somewhere on the bottom. You can see Nest.js, which is a uh, is, is, is quite quite down, etc, etc, etc. And you can see here Solid.js and some other things. So why React? Well, besides the fact that React is an amazing and a very simple library, and a maintained library and a library full of modules and support and stuff. You can practically find anything you imagine when it comes to React. It has a huge community support. Of course, as I said, if you want to find a job in the front end development area, well, this guy is your best bet. <laughs> if we take a look at the other survey here, I just want to make sure that you understand this. Which, which, which is the most demanded front end framework? As we can see here, number of jobs from 2022 to 20. December 2023, so a few months ago, by far again is React, right? So if this doesn't convince you uh, why you should learn React, then I mean you should stop watching this video right now and leave because, you know, you should be driven by logic, by business, by requirements, by needs, and the world and the currently community, well, the community of developers seem to be wanting React. Is that going to change soon? I don't think so because React is also getting a React compiler in the version 19 coming up and I think that's going to even incentivize more people who even maybe stopped using React at one point because of reasons like, you know, having a hard time using effects and, you know, controlling re-rendering and stuff. I think that's going to make things even better. All right, so that's cool. So now we know uh, why you should use React. Let's now talk about the build tools. So when you when you start to, with any of these modern tools uh, and modern frameworks, you have to use the build tools. You have to 
take that framework or a library and transpile it, compile it, whatever, into the actual JavaScript. I'm going to give you a little history of the build tool so you can understand how it works. So maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we used tools like Grunt and Gulp. So when Angular 1 came out and Knockout AG, Knockout JS and Ember JS, we used these task runners like Grunt and then Gulp. And basically, these were the task runners where you say, do this thing, and then do this thing, and then do this thing, etc., etc., etc. So this is how we used to um, compile certain parts of libraries and code, as you can see here, handlebars, Jade, SAS. So basically, if you wanted to take some SAS or less and compile your CSS, compile it into CSS, you would use these tools, right? Tools such as Grunt and Gulp. And then at one point in time, Webpack came out, and this was a huge thing. Webpack made a lot of these things easier because Grunt and Gulp were pretty much... Um, they were At one point in time, they would get hard to, to write and, and, and maintain because you had a lot of these steps, right? So Webpack came out and automated a lot of these things for us. So, so it kind of abstracted away a lot of things. Pretty much what Vita, that we're going to talk about in a second, did back then. Well, uh, uh, today Webpack did it back then. So basically Vita, you can say, is another upgrade of Webpack. So Webpack now is kind of becoming redundant. It's The problem with Webpack is it's written in JavaScript. So it's, it's very slow uh, for, for something such as a build tool. And today we have a build tool called Vita, and this is how we build uh, modern um, libraries. I'm not sure if, uh, if Vue.js Vue and Ag Angular are using Vita, but React.js most commonly today is started using the Vita. Vita basically, if I recall, is written in Rust, and it's very fast, and this is how, we, how you will typically start your React projects, right? So you're going to use this build tool to convert this syntax that the browser doesn't under, doesn't understand into the actual JavaScript that the browser can in fact understand, right? So this is where we're going to start today. This is how we're going to build our first React project. And then we're going to move from there. Uh, so basically, I think this is it's better to start right away. So what we're going to do, we're going to click get started here. And then in the Vita documentation, right, you will and it's a it's a quite awesome documentation i suggest that you bookmark this create a react folder in your bookmarks and as we go through this course make sure to bookmark all of these uh, all of these uh, resources that i'm going to give you along the way right so if we scroll a little bit down uh, you can see that vita has templates and what we're going to do we're going to use this uh, typescript template for react you can see they have solid ts svelte etc etc preact which is a minimal version of react in a way uh, and then we have React TS. So we're going to use uh, this React TS. As you can see, they have some commands. And basically what we have to do, we have to say, depending which package manager you're using, package manager, create <clears throat> Vita, name of your application, then which template you want to use. I'm using PMPM. Uh, just for a record, if you don't know, NPM is a package manager that comes installed with Node.js. Yarn used to be uh, an upgrade to NPM. When Yarn came out, it was faster and better. It's also getting obsolete. PMPM is a new king in the block. It's, it's a lot faster than the previous two. And then BunJS is a JavaScript runtime that came out last year, and it's also super fast. But this is uh, you, you need to install a different runtime. You need to install BunJS. For that reason, I'm going to be using PMPM. And if you don't know how, you can install PMPM by simply having, making sure that you have a Node.js installed and you can just say uh, npm i-g pmpm. This g stands for global and it means it's going to install this PMPM package manager uh, as a global. If you're having a hard time spelling this, it's basically npm and then put a p in front of it. So if you're kind of getting confused, just type npm and then Put a p in front of it that's basically p npm p npm right okay since i have it installed already i'm gonna do pretty much what i said i'm gonna say p npm create and uh yeah so now p npm create vita i'm gonna call this uh youtube react youtube tutorial maybe and then i'm gonna say dash dash and as you can see here i'm gonna use this uh uh, TypeScript template, React TS. If you don't want to use TypeScript, that's fine. You, do, you can just omit this. Uh, uh, you can just use a different template. You can just use React. So you can omit the TS. And then I'm going to say uh, template, right? Now I'm going to say React.TS. 
this is great, right? Now I'm gonna go into that directory that we just created. We created React YouTube tutorial. And I'm gonna pmpm PM install in there, right? So I'm just gonna install these uh, dependencies, right? As you can see, it's very quick. And then I'm gonna type pmpm dev to start the development server. And then if I click over here, you'll notice that, uh, yeah, we're, we're there. We have our first React application with some boilerplate code, which we're gonna remove in a second. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna open this directory in my v Visual Studio Code, or if you're using Vim or whatever, who cares? And yeah, so we're gonna get in here. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see a little bit better. And as you can see, we can we can go a little bit through the React project, the general React project. Uh, in the root folder here is generally your configuration files for the project. In general, these configuration files are gonna grow over time as you add different types of things, uh, tooling, uh, shell scripts, uh, I don't know, Docker image, uh, whatever. But a bunch of these things are gonna uh, uh, evolve and, and grow, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So as you can see here, we, you have the, your Vita config. This Vita config is going to be something definitely that you're going to be working with. We have this uh, config uh, URL here that you can go to, and there's a bunch of things you can you can uh, configure. There's also a bunch of Vita plugins. So for for example, you have Vita Progressive Web App. So if you want to set up, you know, service workers and have progressive web apps, you would set this up. So you go get started. And then they tell you, hey, you know, install this and then go to your, uh, you know, the Vita config and then put this plugin in there, right? So you would typically go to this file and then you would configure a different plugin. Here you would have Vita Progressive Web App. And then as you get the idea, you would configure every single other thing over here, basically, right? TypeScript configuration and other things I'm not going to go into because this goes beyond the scope of the scores. But yeah, this is your typical TS configuration. If you're using TypeScript with any library out there, you're going to have TS config in there. So nothing new, right? Then your package JSON as always with anything else, your heart and soul of your project, your module, it defines the dependencies that you have, that your project must have. It has development dependencies where your project... Um, you know, defines what it is that you need in development, etc, etc. And then starting with index, as with many other libraries, we have a root index file. This is where uh, Vita, uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, um, uh, this is where we have a root uh, for our React app where it's going to render. And then we uh, associate the, the main file that we're going to talk about now. Okay, so before we start with the, with the, with going into React now and stuff, let's just remove some of the files that we don't need. So I'm going to remove the CSS files. I'm going to remove all of this stuff that we don't need. I'm going to remove assets just so we can start very clean here. So I'm going to nuke all of this. I'm going to remove these uh, references to this. I'm going to basically remove all of the stuff that came already, uh, all of this boilerplate that came with the app. So I'm just going to get us to the state where it's clean so we can then start. Okay. So this is now great. So this is now we are looking for the first time into learning React, right? So now you know some history, you know why you want to learn React and stuff. Let's now talk about, you know, learning React. So before we go there, let's talk a little bit about frontend, right? So frontend, what is the frontend development, right? Frontend development, right, is all about controlling some HTML, right? So if I go to this page and I inspect this uh, thing, right? We'll notice that there's a bunch of this HTML all over the place, right? And this is unif uniform to, to every single library out there, right? So what our goal as a front-end developers uh, is, is, hey, well, you know, I need, there's this huge tree of uh, elements, of uh, HTML elements, and all of them have a bunch of attributes and, and properties and stuff. How can I, you know, compose these things into smaller chunks so I can work with it easier? So this is really a gist of, of, of building clients of any kind in the browser or not in the browser, right? It's like, there's always this huge amount of content. How can we segregate that? How can we break it out into small, meaningful, reusable chunks? So then we can build applications easier. We can write less code. We can, you know, apply the dry principle. Don't do not repeat yourself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So how can we achieve that and all of these UI libraries try to achieve the same thing some of them achieve certain things in in, a, in this way in that way and then it boils down to preferences what somebody likes more right but fundamentally when it comes to react as well it's no different than anything else we're gonna have a bunch of different components like think of these things as lego 
and uh, we're gonna be composing these components. So you're gonna have a button, and you're gonna have a, you know a, a, an input, uh, and you're gonna have a drawer or whatever, right? And all of these things are gonna be your building blocks, right? And you're gonna be with all of this. You're gonna have your own library of components. Think of these as tools. Imagine you have a toolbox, and in that toolbox you have all of these different tools, and then you can you know build something with these tools, right? So in your case, the product of the of this component composition, as we like to call it, is some page, aka viewer, right? So we're gonna be combining these boxes with each other, uh, again called component composition. And the outcome of this composition is going to be different pages, aka views, right? So this is really what a front end at the, at the core is. And then, of course, it's about handling events. So the second most important thing about, you know, building any software is handling reacting to events. When I click on a button, do this. When I type this in an input, do this. When I hover my mouse over here, do this. When I click on a link, take me here or take me there. And then uh, lastly and third, it's about business logic. You know, if user is not logged in, show this, otherwise show this. So we're gonna have a lot of conditional rendering as we call it. We're gonna loop through a lot of things. We're gonna get some data from some server and then we're gonna show that on the, on the page. So this, all of this is uh, uniform and agnostic of technology. You do these things in every single tool, right? And this is what we're gonna be doing today, right? If we take a look at the React components, which we're going to write now, you will notice that React components basically as any HTML elements, if we may, if I may, uh, you know, if we take an a image tag in HTML, right? So if we say image and SRC, this is, we're still talking just about plain HTML, right? This is a native HTML component. We can call it like that. It's an image. It takes some attributes, some properties, right? Uh, it takes a SRC and it takes the stacks that describes what this image is, right? If we, uh, if we create, a, let's say, a, um, if we use a button component in, uh, in HTML as well, we're still talking about HTML. If we take a native button component, right? This button is gonna take some content inside it, some sort of a children or whatever, some text, you know, uh, there's different terms that describe how this thing inside of the opening and closing HTML tags can be called. In React, we would call this children, basically a child of a component that wraps it. You have, uh, you know, UI libraries like Svelte.js and uh, Stencil.js. In Stencil, they call it slots. So this would be a slot, right? But the, the idea is always the same. So, right, so in React, this is gonna be very similar, almost identical. In React, we're gonna build our own button. It's just the components in React gonna, like in most other UI libraries, start with a capital letter. So this would be a, basically a replication of the button in React, and then this button we would implement its logic some to, to some degree, right? We would abstract the way we would wrap, we would probably wrap this button and add more functionality, right? So as you can see, uh, building components in any UI library doesn't really differ much. Uh, than building, uh, than using native HTML elements, right? We're still gonna be passing some attributes. In React, we will call them properties, but fundamentally, it's really no different, right? So it's still gonna be the same. Okay, with that said, let's now go to React and write some components, right? So as I said, um, as I said before, uh, uh, we, we will, yeah, explain the component concept and some, so we're gonna have a, a little bit of bottom-up approach and then we're gonna eventually build an app, right? Before we start writing our first component, let's let's take a look at the um, autonomy or, or, or let's take a look at the um, anatomy of, uh, of React, right? So, so as you can see, every React project is gonna have a main file like this and main file is gonna have these, some, these lines. This is the minimum, right? React strict mode, uh, before I explain it, you can always hover over these things and go to the official documentation, but the strict mode in React basically enables us in development to do additional re-renders, to do some checks. So React, if I say may say engine, can give us some warnings and suggestions and errors. So if I hover over this, you can see uh, there's quite nice uh, JS docs here. So I can click React doc docs and open this. And as you can see, strict mode lets you find common bugs in your components early in the development. 
you can scroll a little bit down if you if you want to see what it, what it does and what it doesn't do right there's a lot of stuff here but fundamentally it is uh basically uh it's only enabled in development and it's going to do some additional re-renders and checks to ensure that you're following best practices in react so that's fundamentally what it does if you care to know more and i don't think you do you can always get here and and read more then we have the app this is generally a container component so this is you're always going to have one of these components only and this basically wraps your whole react application right react dom create root also very interesting to mention as you can see here we import this react dom client um library so you, you're probably wondering what is this well as you may know or as, or as may you have heard react js can be used in different with different runtimes we can build you know react native apps we can use it uh, in a server side like with the next js or manually if you build your own rendering engine but either way, this React DOM library that we are importing is the client one. So we're saying, hey, I want to render my React in the browser, right? I don't want to. I don't want to render it anywhere else. So this is a render that works in the browser. So you can build your own render in theory, right? And render this on a smartwatch if you want, right? So fundamentally, this React DOM is going to render our uh, basically React JS objects because this virtual virtual tree, virtual DOM and stuff is going to render it onto the browser and it's going to render it to this element that it finds and this element if you remember if we go to the index html is right here right so if we call this banana then obviously uh over here we have to find the element by the id banana and then render uh render this uh into into the into that element right so our whole application is going to be dynamic of course and it's going to be rendered inside of this div right so if we go actually to the browser and if we go to our application somewhere and are we still running it no so let's say pm pm dev again if you refresh it you'll see we're going to have a blank page because we have no content yet but you can see it is actually rendering so that's great so now when you know what these things are and how it works let's go to our app and we're going to write our first text so here inside of the app we have these things in react there it's called a fragment and fragment basically is just uh usually used to to uh, wrap elements to wrap blocks right so whenever your react component is returning it all can only return one kind of root node so you always have to uh, wrap multiple elements into a single element if you want to react return it from from react so in simple words you cannot use you cannot do this right This is not going to work right you cannot you need to wrap so if you have you have a paragraph here in a span you can see if i hover over it js expressions must have one parent element so in react js you have to do this right all right cool so going back to uh going back to this so now as you can see we have rendered our first react component if we go back here you will notice that we have some text we have this also this extra thing that we don't really need here but as you can see here we have our first text rendered on the page if i go inspect this right you will notice that we have a div we have this id banana that i showed you we have a div paragraph and a span right so this is pretty much um this is pretty much the the application that we have now right uh, as you can, uh, as you may have noticed, when I did this, right, it told us that JSX expressions must have one parent element. But let's focus on JSX. What is JSX, right? JSX is a format. Basically, think of it as a JavaScript and XML or JavaScript and HTML. So this is a format that was it was introduced after the the React JS was released, and essentially it's just an abstraction over the natives of React JS's API. This API uh, is is this basically. So React JS, this is an old link, but uh, it's still relevant. So you can see when uh, when React JS was uh, released, uh, it was obviously we had JSX, but you can actually write React JS like this. You can write React JS using this syntax: React dot create element. So basically, if I and this is a legacy API. So if I take this thing and move it back here, right? Imagine that we instead of doing this, imagine that we did this. We would import our react right 
And if we wanted to, if we wanted to uh, do this, let's just say we had a paragraph, right? Well, this would be create a paragraph and put a hello world text in it. This thing here is, if I recall, the, the API is the props, it's the, it's the attributes we can pass. So, so as you can see, if you compare these two, what do you think is easier to use as, the, as what is the what is better for development experience? Obviously, HTML like syntax, right? Because if we had to write our components like this, it would be incredibly, incredibly hard and error prone. Because think about it here, what if I wanted to add a new element inside of a P? Well, now I would have to start nesting these objects and expressions and functions inside of this create element, right? So this is why JSX exists as a, as a, um, uh, as a concept, right? As a as a way to improve the experience of, of, of developers. You can still, of course, use this. is no longer the the, the actual API. There's a there's a new JSX transform, which is this one. I can show you. So this is this is an old legacy API. But if we scroll a little bit down, this is basically what a what a compiler now in React does. It uses this J JSX runtime, and then it does this basically. So right now you would do something pretty much like this. And as you can see, it's equally ugly, right? So this is just just to make sure that we, we, we follow the, the I shared the correct information with you. But you can see here pretty much if we wanted to, to mimic this thing here, we would still say here paragraph and then children would be hello world, right? So you can see still very ugly, right? So JSX is enabled in uh, modern React applications by default. And keep in mind, you will most likely never in your career see a syntax like this, and you will never want to use this. It's just good to, good to know for you why are these files, uh, why do they have a JSX extension? And if you're wondering how is this JSX actually rendered, we can go to Babel.js, and Babel.js is uh, basically a compiler, a transpiler, and it's used uh, for many JavaScript tasks. It's used nearly with every single library out there. But if we go to try it out, you will notice here in Babel.js that we have these presets, right? And if you don't know JavaScript committee, ECMAScript committee, uh, when, when releasing new JavaScript features, these features have to go to certain stages. Stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage zero uh, and stage one are very early stages of suggestions of features. And most of these JavaScript features get thrown out of the language, right? So as you can see, these stages basically define how far uh, has certain feature came to a point before it's almost released as part of the JavaScript language. You can see here that these things basically are often released as part of Babel.js way ahead. So we can start using new JavaScript features even though they're not released to the public. And we can do that because we have this Babel, which is gonna take this new syntax and convert it into working JavaScript that's already supported in the browser. So with that said, you can see we also have React here, right? Uh, so Babel also supports React. So if we go ahead and try to paste some of this stuff over here, you will notice basically how this code is, what it actually is when it's compiled. And you can see here if I function app return hello world, this is basically what gets created, right? So import JSX function app return blah, 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 right? So if I do a little bit more, you know, if I create a span in here, so if we do a little bit more uh, nesting of uh, these elements, right? You will notice over here, hi, uh, I am a span, right? So you can see here in the right what's happening, right? And as I said a minute ago, imagine that we, instead of writing this JSX, imagine that we had to nest our code like this, because you can see now what's happening. We have created our paragraph, which is a root, and then the paragraph has children, which is a span, and then this, Span has high, I'm, I am a span, right? But you can see the complexity. Of course, our components are going to be very complex. What if there was another paragraph inside of here, right? Even though that's not very semantic. But the, the point is, you know, is merely to, you know, I am not a very sem semantic uh, paragraph, right? Well, now we have another level of nesting, right? So you can see if we get over here, children, 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 right? So you can clearly notice that writing stuff like this and writing stuff like this is vastly different. This is way easier for us to reason about than reading this this gibberish, this, uh, right? Or writing it, right? So again, you can literally, instead of using JSX, you don't have to, you can literally do this yourself. If you wanted to write React like this, you can, but again, 
if you if we apply some common sense you'll notice why you don't want to do that right okay so this now basically um this should get you to the point of understanding js what jsx is that is just a format that enables developers to be more productive and this is what babel js does so if you're ever wondering what the hell is actually happening behind the scenes uh, or somebody asks you in an interview or whatever, you can always say, all right, actually, I know Alex Alex actually showed me how, how to use JSX. Okay, with that said, now we are basically done with a lot of this uh, theory and stuff. Now we can actually build components, right? So let's, so as you can see, I'm now returning some uh, stuff directly from my application. Let's create a, actually a new component. And for the, for the sake of this first video of this tutorial, I will basically just writing everything in a single file and then as we progress in time I'm going to show you how to structure your React projects, what are the best practices and stuff. But for now, let's not increase the complexity and add uh, you know, too much, too much in your brain, too many things to think about. We want to just focus now on components. So I'm going to go and create a component and I'm going to call this component a, uh, a button for example, right? So I'm going to say, uh, you know, I can say uh, function button. And uh, I can return literally just a plain HTML button. And what I'm going to do, I will just come over here and I'm just going to return a button, right? Like this. And if I go to my application, you will see that there's a plain HTML button, literally nothing special about it. It's a normal button. So I'm basically creating a button that returns an HTML, plain HTML button, right? But you can see that right now this button has a text here that I can't change. So uh, it would be nice if this button, right, can be a reusable, like Lego, right? Like something that you can, you know, like a bottle. I can put milk in this bottle. I can put water. I can put tequila, whiskey, chocolate milk, whatever I want. It's a reusable. It has one function. This bottle, I use it for one thing. I use it to drink liquids, right? So this is how you should be thinking about designing your functions, your components. They should be doing one thing, right? Why? Because I can reuse them for various things and combine them with various things. So how can we now, you know, change this text to be something else? Well, we need to pass some attribute. Just as if you remember, just as you had an image in HTML, these are attributes, these are properties. In React, we call them properties, but they're really attribute, arguments, whatever you want to call them. Because you can see React uh, components are just plain functions, just normal functions, right? We can, we can pass some uh, properties to this button, right? So I can either the structure in place, if you know JavaScript, or I can just pass this props. Usually we call it props, and it's just an object. So every component in, in React.js takes literally uh, just an object that can have n number of properties on it. Uh, so here I'm going to say, well, okay, well, this thing I want to call, how do I want to call this property? I don't know. Maybe props.text, right? And now I can pass some text here. So, so, but I, I, I can do it in a very, in, in a slightly different way. So I'm very cautiously trying to explain this. So here now I can say text and I can say, uh, I'm, uh, I can say I'm a very cool button, right? So if we go back here, it says I'm a very cool button. Now I have passed this text, right? And this is literally how you pass, um, uh, regular props to uh, to components in React. You just, just as you did with plain HTML, you have a key, uh, a name of a property of an attribute, and then you pass it some string. But as you can see, something strange has happened here. Why are we passing text here? What if I wanted to pass another element in here? What if I wanted to pass anything really in here? What if I wanted this button to have other HTML elements, children, right? And that's that's where one exception comes in. In React, these props they can they can get the children prop. Like I said, in Stencil JS, you have slots. In other URL libraries, you, these names are called differently. But I don't really want my button to be like this. I want my button to look really like an HTML button, like this. It has an opening and closing tags, and then I can pass something to it like this, right? So you can see now my button is like has a self-closing tag instantly. So let's fix that. So I'm gonna still do this, do that, right? So how can I pass this thing now as a span or whatever to the button, right? So let's actually try to demonstrate that. So here I want to say, uh, you know, I want to pass a span and inside of there I want to say, hi, 
I'm a button passed as children. So if I get over here, we're not going to see that because we're still passing this wrong. But if I say props that children, now we can see that, right? So children is a unique prop, unique attribute, unique argument that whenever you use it, you're basically creating an element that has opening and closing tags. If you're not using children at all, then your component that you're building is a self-closing component. And you can, most of your components are going to be self-closing components. So in simple words, if you create an input component like this, it's going to be self-closing because inputs typically don't take children like that, right? So if you create another component here called input that just as well just wraps uh, the, 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 the regular HTML input, you can see that even the regular HTML input in just a normal HTML is not doesn't have an opening and closing tags. It just has a closing tag here, right? So you can see our input basically this looking like this would be simply let's wrap this in a fragment or in a div as we said in React uh, a component can only return one uh, one thing you can see now if I say input we're gonna have a button and we're gonna have an input right of course in JavaScript we have uh, object and uh, destructuring right array destructuring as well uh, so if you if you don't want to pass these props like this you can destructure in place like this and then over here um, you can do it like this. This component right now is they're super simple, super, super dumb. Um, it's a first video, right? And then if we go back here, this is still gonna work, right? So that's pretty much all. As you can see, we're getting these warnings. Why? Because we're using TypeScript and we're not um, uh, adding our types, our annotations. So let's do that very quickly. You will notice that over time, as you learn React, React obviously like all other libraries, all other frameworks ha has its own types you know that come install the TypeScript with a react and as you can see the children is of type react node react node is a very uh, common uh, type that you're gonna be using if we actually go here to react TypeScript cheat sheet it's a super super nice resource here I highly advise you to to uh, to use this because you're gonna have uh, you will very quickly learn the react types if you if you use this and as you can see here if you if we go back here you typing children basically children is any any HTML node right the most common use case for react node is typing children component accepts anything that react can render as children here are some examples right okay that's great so now as you, you can see we're adding some types uh, what I'm actually going to show you now is a more typical way that you're going to be writing React components, and it's usually not using a function keyword, it's using a const, basically creating a, a function uh, uh, expression, right? So this is a function declaration. In JavaScript, you can, you know, define functions in multiple ways, unfortunately, as function expressions and function declarations. So generally, the way that we write React components usually looks like this. So I'm going to comment this one out, and I'm just going to say, actually, I'm just going to copy and paste it. And I'm going to say const button. And then you're going to do this. And then we're going to do a lambda function, right? And then we generally don't write the types here. We use this uh, fc uh, type, which stands for functional component. And then we pass it a prop like this, right? If we hover over this, represents the type of a function component. You can optionally receive a type argument that represents the prop component receives right so it's a basically a generic right and if you again if you uh, need more examples you can hover over down here so this is amazing a lot of people neglect this it's super useful you should use these your this IntelliSense and stuff because it can save you a lot of time and if we get basically here function components these can be written as normal functions that take a props argument and turn GSX element right so this is a more typical way you're gonna be seeing components written because we, in React, since uh, hooks came out, which we're going to talk in a separate video about, uh, since we dropped class-based class, uh, class -based components, we are basically writing these very simple functions that return uh, just some HTML or JSX that's then, as we saw, um, uh, compiled into these uh, lower-level React APIs and then later on compiled into whatever, right? So this is so if you take a look at very quickly at this component here, this is why I love React, right? This is why I think React is absolutely an amazing, arguably, of course, very subjectively, the most beautiful UI library ever written. 
The reason why I say that is because when I look at this, it's so simple. You have a basic function now that takes some attributes. It can take, right now we are only getting children, but we can take 500 others if we want. And then it returns some HTML, right? React can, as any other library, as any other framework, any other language, you know, can be your best friend or your worst friend. A lot of people associate their inability to write UIs because of lack of uh, experience. They attribute these mistakes to libraries. I can tell you that if you can write code, if you know the patterns, if you have gained sufficient experience, you will build your code in any of these UI libraries amazingly well, or it's going to be terrible, right? So React can be written beautifully if you apply to some of the patterns I'm going to teach you along the way of this, of this tutorial. But in simple words, this is in a nutshell a component that does one thing, and this is a perfectly looking component. Let's imagine here now that we wanted to add uh, on click handler. So when I click on this button, I want something to happen, right? How do we do that? Well, first we're gonna extend our ty type here. I'm gonna add this on click. Question mark means it's an optional thing, so you can pass it if you want or you don't have to. And then here on the button, I'm simply gonna pass here. I'm gonna say on click. And then here I'm gonna say on click, on click. Literally as easy as that. So now my button, here I can say on click, and when I click it, I'll do an alert. You have clicked a button. If you go back to our project, to our Vita project here, you have clicked a button, right? You get, a, you get the idea, right? So now, of course, you would do more logic, more business logic. You would maybe use some UI library, right? Some Tailwind or whatever. Let's actually... Right now, I'm not going to be setting up Tailwind in this video, but let's imagine we have some CSS, right? Let's let's add uh, some class name to this. Let's call it a button. Let's imagine this is our core library, right? Here, over here, I'm going to say button, and I'm going to say appearance, none, whatever. Let's, let's use some border, none, border radius, color, whatever. And then we're going to import our CSS in there, right? So I'm going to say import and then dot slash style CSS. And now we have some different looking button. It's a pretty terrible button, but uh, we should probably add some padding as well. Let's say eight pixels, right? And now we have a different looking button, right? There we go. So this is some CSS. Typically in, in modern development today, a lot of people love Tailwind CSS. I personally love it a lot. And I think we're gonna do that at one point as well. So what did we cover so far? We covered the component. We just said that it's a reusable unit of HTML eventually. We covered that there's this special case of children where whenever you use children, you're having a component that has opening and closing tags that where you can kind of nest other ch children, right? That's in, in most of these UI libraries and in HTML natively, there's always a parent to child relationship. This doesn't come from the modern libraries. It comes from just the HTML and the, this huge HTML DOM tree, right? So if we take a look at this example here, when we're, where we're using our button, you can say that the span is a child of a button. So this is a parent, this is a child. And then the parent of this whole thing is a div, right? And then the parent of a div would be a body or something else where it's wrapped, right? You can always see these things if we get over here. We have this div, which is also a child of banana, and banana is child of, bo of a body, and body is part of the HTML document, right? So it, that's literally how it works. Um, okay, so that's that's awesome. Now, before we uh, stop with this video, uh, because uh, this is literally what a component is, and I'm gonna give you maybe something to play with, one thing that we can see now is that this is very coupled now. So how do we structure these components in React? Generally, in React projects, you're gonna have a directory called components, and inside of these components, each each folder, each component is going to have its own folder. So in, in our context of our button, we're going to have a button. And there, for now, I'm going to have, I'm going to move this style CSS. And then I'm going to create a, a button.tsx for now. And I'm simply going to move this logic to, to the button itself, right? And I'm gonna export this button. Now you can export button or any component, sorry, in two ways, either using a default export or just exporting it as a 
object property. Basically, we're not going to get into details of this. This is not specific to React. You can do this uh, different teams, use different styles, if I may. So there's no standard in React how you do this. So what I'm trying to say, you can either do export default here, or you can export your button like this, for example, right? And then if you're building a core library, you can uh, centralize your exports in a single file and then export them from there, right? So this depends of how you wanna, on how you want to structure your projects, right? But fundamentally, it doesn't really matter. Please do not waste time with this. You will you focus on building things, as I always say. Don't worry too much about these types of things. I'm going to go and create this input as a component as well. So I'm going to go into an input and I'm going to also create input.tsx and I'm going to move the input in there. I'm just going to leave it as stupid as it is and intentionally I'm going to leave it as a function just so you can memorize that uh, React components can be really written with a regular function declaration, syntax, which is this, or a function expression, which is this. Why is it called an expression? Well, because we are assigning a function like this, an expression uh, in this way. We're assigning a function, a lambda function, an arrow function to a variable, right? And then if we go back here now, we're gonna do an input as well. So now, as you can see, we have our own little app, first app that we built, and uh, it has a button that has some children and it has an input that doesn't do anything right now, right? Let's maybe do a few more things before we round up this first video. So let's make sure that this input, when we type something in it, that it at least prints what we're writing. I, I'm very cautious not to get into this state now and stuff because we're going to do that in the next video. So for now, let's just go into this input and make sure when I type something inside of this input that we at least print something to the console. So, so I'm going to go here uh, and explicitly leaving this as a function declaration, I'm going to say on change. And this unchange is going to get some uh, text, which is going to be a string. Uh, so it's a function, it's going to return nothing, basically. And we need to obviously uh, do this a little bit differently. So I'm going to take this out and here I'm going to say unchange and I'm going to pa paste this basically. It's, it's my type, right? Of course, it's a good practice that you create your interfaces and stuff separately than inlining them like this. So you can say interface, you know, input props, and then you can do it like this. It's way easier to read, and then it's a good practice to keep your types in a separate file as well. What I generally do, and this comes from different, uh, inspired by different languages, I usually put an I in front of my interfaces, so it kind of indicates that it's an interface. So now, instead of inlining it here, which looks ugly, I can just say uh, input props like this, right? And of course, uh, because we are, uh, you know, destructuring here in place, we should probably do something like props and then input props, right? Like this, pretty much, right? And then here now, because I have this on change, I'm gonna say on change and then props dot on change, right? As you can see now, one thing, it, the TypeScript is complaining because I said that this thing is a text. And of course it's wrong because our on change handler, if we go into it, we can see that there's this change event handler and basically what, it, what it's going to give us is this target, right? Event.target. So basically, uh, we're going to talk about that in another video, but uh, React uh, wraps the uh, native um, event system with its own synthetic system, which we're going to discuss soon. But in simple words, not to bore you too much right now. So this is basically an event. And what I need to do, I need to do something like event. I believe target.value, right? And now this should yield me the text that I want. So the text that's in the input, right? So this is great. So now we have on change in our input. And if we go back here, and as you can see also, it's a mandatory uh, attribute property. So it's saying, hey, you have input, but on change is missing, right? So here I'm gonna say on change. And then whenever I type something, I will want to print this text, right? If we do that and save it, and we go back here, as I typed, we should be seeing some text. And as you can see, we do see that text, right? So, la 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 la, right? So, you get the idea, right? So now we have this text. So the next most common thing would be to learn about state. So, hey, okay, as I type this text, or as I press this button, how can I save the value of this input somewhere, right? So let's maybe leave that for, for a different video. So for now, what I want you to do as, um, so for now, for now, what I want you to do is I want you to open 
create your VTIP project like this, open a single app file as I did, and just build tiny components. What I also want you to do is uh, find the page that you like. So for example, if we go back here, go to, let's say free templates, CSS, whatever. Take a scre screenshot of something, right? For example, let's take a look at this. Yeah, let's, exactly, this is a great example. So take, a, take something like this, get it in your drawing tool, like I do draw IO, like this, and try to, in a single file, don't worry about breaking things down, don't worry about TypeScript, don't worry about anything. Try to break this down into different components. So if you use some logic, you will realize that this here, I don't know where I can I change the color. No, I don't want to. But this thing in here, wait a minute, where, is, where can I change the color of this? But just use paint, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so this thing in here is one React component, right? So you want to start there. You want to build a component that takes a title as a prop, text as a prop, description, you have to name it, a date, and category, right? So you wanna design now, so your first assignment should be, I need to design a component that takes a text, so it takes few properties and image, and then style this with, uh, with CSS. Do the same here. I have a component that's called sidebar or whatever. It has an image, description of the person, and whatever, right? So play with this in a single file, get a feeling of passing props, returning JSX, making few mistakes, adding basic CSS, right? And once you do that, you don't need state or any compl complex things for this. You don't need React router. You don't need uh, any complicated things. So this is what literally React is for. If you wanna build this whole page, you can build it fully just with this plain React that we have here. You can build it in a single file here. Once you do that, at one point in time, you're gonna say, huh, when I click on this, this thing needs to be red. When I click on this, I need to go to a different page. When I do this, this has to happen. This is when we need to start using state, potentially using the router so we can support multi-page, multi-view environment, etc., etc., etc. So basically, this marks the first video of my React series. What, what have we learned? We learned that React is highly popular, that there's a lot of jobs for it. We learned that React is, we learned some previews, compiler, some tools that we used in a JavaScript landscape long ago, Grunt and Gulp and uh, Webpack. Now we're using uh, Vite as our bundler. We learned about JSX and about it being uh, transpiled or compiled uh, using Babel into that JavaScript syntax, which then creates the virtual DOM that we're gonna also talk about at one point. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, we made some React components. So your assignment now is to find some template you like, build some React markup, and then in the next video, we're gonna start with uh, some state and some more complicated subjects. If you like this video, please write a comment, share it, subscribe, and I'll see you in another one. Peace out, everybody. Cheers, bye-bye.